Hello, I am Michael Gaucher, and I'm building a .NET program. I'm building an RSS reader program using .NET on Microsoft Windows 11 with an Intel Pentium processor and four gigabytes of RAM. The programming language that I'm using is C Sharp, and the impression for many that do not engage with the software development process at a very tangible and intricate level is that uh, software kind of has a magical quality about it. But in reality, software, most software is built using building blocks. These building blocks is called an API, Application Programming Interface. And the, the term API is very synonymous with what you might call uh, building blocks in the real world, where if I want to build a fence, my building blocks is going to be wood and to be more accurate when we're talking about an API, not wood that I have to cut myself, but um, actual wood panels, right? And then um, those panels can either snap into a, a horizontal board, right? And that board could be, um, you know, made out of plastic or metal, or um, I could use nails, screws, uh, uh, nuts and bolts, any number of things. Those are all API, right? And basically, the way to put a fence together, um, all the, the elements are there to just do that. Now, by itself, a, a board, right, is not a fence. But when I combine multiple boards, that multiple vertical boards, and I combine that with a horizontal board that goes across them in the middle, right, and I com combine them together with screws or nails or what have you, getting the use string, um, then that is a fence, but the individual units themselves are not the fence. Th those are the elements that you use to build the fence. And that's what an API is in programming. And so when programs are built using programming languages, the majority of the, of the time, um, we're using API. We're using a toolkit, you might say, a toolkit. Um, and there are different toolkits. Just like with that fence, uh, putting the, that fence together, um, you could just snap together the, um, the boards and the panels and you have a fence. There are also uh, more difficult ways to make a fence. You can go and cut down the tree. Um, you can get a saw, electric saw. You can um, go at it that way. You can uh, grind down uh, the boards uh, using sand, sand, sandpaper, sand process. Um, you can make the nails yourself. You can make the screws yourself. You can um, melt the, um, the the ore, um, the iron ore. You can you can uh, melt that down into uh, molds for the nails. Um, we can take that example. We can go to such a level of, of detail and intricacy that maybe the board that you create with that process is uh, an ex the the and the fence you create with that process is, is an exceptional fence. But it takes a lot of effort to do that. Then you can go the total opposite direction with that, where you want large sections of the fence to already be made. So you don't even put boards together. You just put sections of fence together, right? Well, in all those examples, we're still talking about building blocks. It just depends on what, what level of building blocks we're talking about. Our very detailed, granular, uh, individual building blocks, um, larger uh, composite building blocks that we put together or macro level building blocks where things are just uh, super easy to put together and accomplish in a short amount of time. And that's how programming happens uh, from the most detailed but long uh, uh, time process, long duration process to the most uh, generic, general, um, but very fast uh, to uh, put together process. And while it would seem very appealing to write programs quickly, there's a cost to that. Because what you don't control, what you gain in speed, you lose in control. And what you don't control can um, be less uh, appealing when we're talking about performance, stability, security, those kind those types of illities, right? Um, and so there's trade-offs. 
Sometimes you don't care about those trade-offs and you want the program built as quickly as you can. Uh, other, other times you, you just want that control so that you can um, steer and direct the program uh, according to your more complete vision. And so, but regardless, uh, it's, it's all about the APIs. And the majority of the time an API is required to make a program. There are some exceptions to that. Um, there are low level programs, you know, the type of um, low level programs that might run um, some little small chip in a smartwatch, right? That program may not use an API at all. It may, be, it may just be straight code. And then there are the APIs that the code underneath them are not API at all. It, it is the actual fundamental raw code needed to make the API a reality. But then you reach a point where you have APIs built on top of APIs, right? So you got building blocks built on top of building blocks. And so APIs, regardless of their form, their, their intentions are the same. They are intended to enhance the quality of the programs and the speed of software development and to add the governing policies of the software developers or the organizations that institute the APIs. And when I say that, I mean some APIs, they ensure that certain security policies are applied and are active. Um, but APIs, while they exist and they make life uh, easy, APIs, they, they can be understood by their names alone in a lot of cases, but in most cases, you don't even know an API is there. And so to help with this process, you need documentation. And one of the things that I do before I embark on a software development process, journey, um, trial, gauntlet, is I make sure that I have documentation. If I don't have documentation about the APIs that I'm gonna use, the platform that I'm going to use, you name it, if I don't have adequate documentation, there's no point in continuing further, right? Unless I wanna be um, a, a, a true sadist and, you know, have the dog chase me, right? You know, um, because you can be dogged in a software development uh, enterprise by inadequate documentation. I've worked with some Borland Delphi programs and some Visual Foxmo programs where I eventually succeeded in doing the things that needed to be done that the people who wanted those programs modified. I eventually succeeded in getting that done, but where the documentation was woefully inadequate, it, it, was, it, was, uh, it was quite tough. And so in my own projects that I do at home, I have the, the uh, luxury, uh, the liberty of pursuing documentation and taking my time, right? Just the other day, I was looking for documentation for GTK MM. That's the C++ uh, plus bindings for GTK MM. I've used GTK MM before, but now that GTK 4 is out, I wanted up-to-date documentation for that. And, you know, sometimes you can find a convenient PDF for these things, and sometimes you can't. So I had to download the programming with GTK MM uh, source code, which includes a documentation directory, and I had to compile the PDF uh, from scratch using um, the, the data available to me on GitHub. I was fortunate I had the knowledge and ability to work through that because the README documentation that told you how to build a project, total non-starter, you know, but I eventually got through it and got it done. Um, so anyway, um, there's a tool on Linux called DevHelp that allows you to um, uh, have documentation in a visual form that you can access. Microsoft has a similar tool for Windows called um, uh, Microsoft Help Viewer that you can access through Visual Studio. And that is the documentation tool that is used in this process to um, find our API definitions that we need to know in order to make the right invocations through software to produce our user interface.
You can press the F1 button in Visual Studio to get help on wherever your mouse or keyboard is focused on at the time you press F1. I did not want to go to the internet when I press F1 and instead wanted to default to local help information saved on the computer. So I went through the Visual Studio installer to put the help viewer in place. It took a good minute, a bit longer than 20 minutes, but it's worth it. Once help viewer is properly installed, I can then click on help from within Microsoft Visual Studio and the program will launch. You can manage help content and add help books, catalogs, sections to the local help viewer database. The amount of time this setup takes place relates to the number of help catalogs sections you need. In this case, I would not ascribe the length of time entirely to the fact that we're on a low-end computer when doing the updates to the help viewer database. What you do is you go through and you select which help content you want and click update. Now, it did take quite a bit of time for the help viewer content updates to download and get installed. But I've noticed in the past that even on a higher end computer, it could take quite a bit of time. And so I don't think the computer is an issue with the length of time it takes to update. Okay, so once the documentation updates are done, the help viewer is ready to go. Draw your attention to the left side of the screen where we now have help topics listed that we can click on. Before we get into that though, let's close out of Help Viewer and reinitiate it from within Microsoft Visual Studio. This provides a chance to see if it is really set up correctly. Notice that what I called catalogs, Help Viewer calls books. Several books are in place and you'll notice on the uh, left hand side we can navigate through topics very easily in a tree like structure. Since all these books are now in place and we have the information quickly at our fingertips we are now ready to code. We are really ready to code. So let's go build a user interface.